All right, let's go ahead and let's open up in prayer. Uh, Father, we, uh, we thank you so much, God, for just your, for who you are, Lord. We thank you so much, God, that you, you've done it all. You saved us through Jesus Christ, the Lord, and, and it doesn't stop there, God. You give us your Holy Spirit that dwells within us, that guides us, that leads us, that bears witness with our spirit, that tells us, if you will, uh, through certain ways that we have eternal life. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit. We thank you bears fruit in our lives, produces fruit in our lives that we never once, never before had, God. And all this is your doing. And we thank you. Uh, we thank you for the study that we've been able to really dig down deep. And we just pray, God, that you would, even tonight, uh, by your spirit, open our hearts and our minds to the truths of your word, God, and, and guide us in this study, please. Help us to understand the truths of your word that we would know the working of the spirit in our lives. Thank you, Father, for all you do, and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are in our study, Assurance of Salvation. Of course, Discipleship 101, Assurance of Salvation, Assurance, and that's what we've been looking at. We're going to continue in our study, Assurance of Salvation. And we saw that, as I wrote up here, as children of God, we can know that we have eternal life. That's one of the great promises of Scripture and of this salvation that we have through Jesus Christ is that as children of God, guess what? We can know. Now, does that mean we're not ever going to doubt? No. It's written for a reason. John wrote for a reason. I'm writing these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. God already knew. He knew we were going to have doubts. You know, he knew we were up against an enemy that's been doing this a lot longer than us. He knew, so he encouraged us. And again, we saw that as children of God, we can know we have eternal life. Okay, <clears throat> We saw in a couple ways, and that's what we're looking at. There's a few different ways. The first way we saw was the witness of the Bible. The witness of the Bible. Now, just for uh, recap's sake, because it's been a couple weeks, we're going to go ahead and we're gonna, I'm going to read a couple things here. And obviously, 1 John 5, 11 through 13, uh, we read, that was our passage, if you will, of full mention, and it says, and the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life. Oh, by the way, when God gives something, does he ever take it back? And if God gives you eternal life, guess what? You ain't getting it back. Oh, and that's for eternal, right? <laughs> oh, man, wow. I mean... Anyway, you guys know where I'm coming from. God, this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, but only for a little while. And you better behave yourself or you're going to lose it. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous, guys? I mean, just quit discouraging people with your, you can lose your salvation stuff. And it says, and this life is in his son. Verse 12 says, he who has the son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. In verse 13, John says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. We have a written account. A written account right here in the Scriptures. John 20, verse 31 says this, But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now we're going back to the book of John, the epistle of John, John chapter 20, verse 31. If you guys want to turn there with me, because this kind of ties in. Same guy writing, right, John, and he's writing, he's writing this, and he is writing in the epistle, John chapter 20, verse 31, and then we'll read this together. Guys, we got a lot of ground to cover, and I don't know how far we're going to get tonight. We're just going to go with it. You know what I mean? This is part two of the witness of the Holy Spirit, by the way. So we're just going to keep going. We're going to keep on going. So John chapter 20, verse 31. Actually, let's just look at verse 30. It says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And then, bam, you just, you just zip this thing right over, right, to 1 John 
chapter 5, verses 11 through 13. And look how this just ties in. 1 John 5. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Hmm, interesting. Let me see if I can do this in such a way. It ties it all together. Not that I need to. It's already tied together, right? You guys with me on this? All right. So, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name, right? You with me on this? He's writing. Man, hey, guys, these things have been written, right? They're written so that you may believe in Jesus Christ. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. These things I have written to you who do believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. I mean, I don't know. These are pretty much written accounts, right? We're looking at what? The witness of the Bible. Who's the, who's the, who's the author of the Bible? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. For all Scripture is given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, or better said, God breathed. God breathed. Theos pneuma. Theos pneuma. It is theos, God. Pneuma is the Greek word for the Holy Spirit. It's where we get the word pneumatics. Air driven, air power, air. Pneuma. He's invisible. We can't see him. Anybody ever seen the Holy Spirit? <laughs> me neither and that, that's what we're going to look at too and that's interesting but again we're looking at the biblical account okay so we have the written account john 20 31 we have first john 5 11 through 13 right we have a written account an inspired god-breathed written account that leads us to first believe in jesus christ right i write these things to you that you may believe in jesus christ right First, so that those who receive the account may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing we have the life. Secondly, we have a written account, an inspired, God-breathed account of assurance that as believers, we can know beyond the benefit of a doubt that we have eternal life. And that's pretty cool, right? I mean, how awesome is God? You know, God, I just wish you wouldn't leave me hanging. I wish you would give me a sign. Speak to me, God. And you know what he does? Here you go. <laughs> Here you go. And just, there you go. That's how we're going to speak. Anyway. So 1 John 1, 4 says this. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. So we have here a written account so that even our joy may be made complete. 1 John 2, 1, John writes so that we may not sin we may not sin. I write these things to you that you may not sin. And that when we sin, guess what? We have an advocate, Jesus Christ, and his righteousness that covers our sin. So he wrote to those that they may believe. He wrote to those who do believe that they know. He wrote that your joy may be made complete. He writes that you may not sin. And if you do, you have These are all written accounts, written accounts. Uh, if you're trying to trail with that, 1 John 1, 4... And then the other passage was uh, 1 John 2, 1. And what I'm doing is, is how I study Scripture. I'm looking at this, right? We have this written account. We have this what? This witness of the Bible. I write these things to you. So what I did is in my search, I looked for all the places where written was used. And these things I have written to you for this reason. There's a bunch. And you see all these biblical accounts, if you will, witness of the Bible, things that were written for specific reasons. These things I write to you for this. These things have been written to you for that. You know what I mean? So, and that's, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at these accounts. Many things are written 
They are recorded. They are testimonies that are given to us on our account, right? On our behalf, that we may know certain things about who we are in Jesus Christ. Who we are, right? The New Testament, two things. What to believe, how to behave. Who you are, what you believe, and then how to behave, right? That you may not sin. And if you do, guess what? You've got an advocate with the Father. You know, praise God. Jesus Christ, the righteous. And... Uh, and then, of course, it's a no wonder our assurance of salvation is recorded for us that we may know that we have eternal life. Okay, that's the biblical account. I went a little further. There's, there's a lot more there, guys. Are just you guys with me? Yeah. Right? We have a biblical account, right? That assures us that we are saved, right? All right, cool, easy enough. Then we started to deal with the next witness, and that is number two, the witness of the Holy. Spirit, the witness of the Holy Spirit. As much as I would love to, and maybe we will, because the church needs to, um, we need to have eventually, Lord willing, and we will, a very exhaustive, not because it's going to make you tired, but just a very exhaustive study on the multi and the many ministries of the Holy Spirit. Um. You know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but because of, I think, a lack of knowledge today in the church and of lack of these things being taught, people are so quick to jump on things and to do things and act certain ways because somebody says, look at this, God's doing a great work here, look at this, and, and, and you really, I can't find that anywhere in Scripture. I don't see that as being anything that the Holy Spirit is behind, which then makes me question and wonder, you know, what is going on? as we talk about what in the world is going on. This is not a fruit that is produced by the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. I can't find it, and I've looked. So we'll get there eventually, Lord willing, where we just go through and we do an exhaustive study on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But again, we're here and on the second one here, the witness of the Holy Spirit. And the first thing we dealt with last time was the foundation of our assurance. You guys remember that? The foundation of our assurance, which is Jesus Christ, okay? And that is Jesus Christ because he is our foundation. We know that we will never, by praise God, be moved away from that foundation in any eternal matter, right? Because God is the one who has given us eternal life, correct? And it's only for a little while. We just got to hope that you don't mess it up in any which way. And no, of course, I'm being sarcastic. In other words, he is the reason that we are saved. And so with that, we are secure. I'm not saved on my life. I'm not saved on my merits. I'm not saved on my works. I'm not saved on my death. I'm not saved on my holding on. I'm saved by his life, his works, his death, burial, and resurrection, his holding on to me. That's what I'm saved. Last time I checked, that's pretty secure. And this is encouraging, and this we need to know. We need to have these promises as Christians so when we are going through it, we can go, no, I'm secure. I'm good. I know I, you know, I know I'm going to sin. I know I'm going to you know, do things, but I want to be like him in everything. That is how the Spirit bears witness, uh, if you will, one of the ways in our lives. So, he is the reason we are saved. So with that, we are secure. Our salvation rests in Jesus Christ, his person and works alone on the cross. He paid the price once for all, for all who will come to a true knowledge of him that leads to a believing faith, a true faith in Jesus Christ, right? That's our foundation. The second thing we dealt with was the source of our assurance, and this is where it ties directly into the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who makes us, if you will, dynamically aware of our salvation, okay? Just to be very clear, this is not done in some external, radical, irrational, or uncontrollably emotional experience that will make you do things that are not biblical. This is not a matter of shaking and baking and moving and falling on the floor and rolling around and convulting. This is not a matter of things that are uncontrollable. Why? 
The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. These things look all fancy and schmancy. Guys, I mean, I say this because I was involved when I was a brand new Christian with some Christian rappers, and we did some videos, and I'm in some things, and whatever the case may be, and I hung around these guys. It was, it was awesome as a brand new Christian. I'm like, God, why wow, I'm catapulted into this? Like, this is big deal, you know? A brand new Christian, immature, not knowing, looking at the external things, and the prayer circles were just chaos, chaos you got a lot of people in a circle and everybody's going off at the same time it's like well and then all of a sudden out of the corner because this is the loudest one and everybody's like, oh, oh, oh he's spiritual no that's disrespectful and then gibberish and, and stuff and, and guys it's just I, I i went home concerned and i had some serious concerns and then you know you see him at another show and i went to the last one and and he's down at the front of the stage, right? And he's, he, he's, he's doing this, and he's moving. He's on his knees, and it's just gibberish, right? First off, you know, I, I would never, ever try to uh, accredit the Holy Spirit for something that is not understood. And gibberish is not understood. There's nothing. And it just that. And then gets up on the stage and explains to everybody why he does that. You know, it's like... Whoa, man, <laughs> I just, very uncomfortable, very, and, and this is what is called, if you will, they attribute this to the Holy Spirit. This, how's your life? How's your love, joy, peace? How, how's your walk with Jesus Christ? So that's why this is a big deal to me, uh, because I was in the middle of it, and I, I experienced it, and it, it's not, I, I'm sorry, I can't find it. I cannot find it. And it makes me wonder because you're, you're attributing these things to the Holy Spirit, yet I can't find it in the Bible. I'm concerned. Shouldn't I be? Shouldn't we be? I don't see this being anything of the Holy Spirit. It's coming from somewhere. There's a source behind it. It is the Holy Spirit who makes us dynamically aware of our salvation. And again, just to be clear, this is not done in some radical, irrational, or uncontrollably emotional experience that will make you do things that are not biblical. The Holy Spirit makes us aware because he awakens us internally. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were cut off from anything that had anything to do with God completely. You didn't know his word. You couldn't. You didn't know what it was to have his spirit in you that illuminated the word for you, that helped you understand, that led, that, that gave you a new heart. And you didn't know. You were dead. Last time I checked, dead things don't do much. Romans 8.16 says this, the spirit himself testifies Romans 8, 16. Like I said, let's go ahead. We'll just go ahead and just, just flip with me to these. We'll go ahead and we'll go through them. Um, these are great passages to know, to memorize, to, to just have in your, if you will, arsenal. Because guess what? When Satan comes attacking, you can come back a whacking, you know what I mean? <laughs> like with the word of God, you whack him in the head with it, you know? You use the sword of the spirit. Romans 8, 16 says, The Spirit himself, a ah, personal pronoun for someone, not something, testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Children of God. Okay. Testifies is the word smartereo. This is to testify jointly, to corroborate by evidence. What do I mean? That's a great question. And I'm glad you asked, Bob. I really am. I mean, you guys are on the ball. What I mean is simply this. Our adoption as children of God is valid because the Holy Spirit testifies to this validity. Okay? Not by way of some mystical experience. It's not some mystical voice off in the distance that speaks to me. 
and has me running around telling people what God said. Because I tell you what, uh, just months ago, I would have told you what I believed God said was that building over there off a of homestead was perfect. Do you see what I mean? Where are we today? Oh, man, this building is open. We talked to the guy. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. It's perfect. Do you see, what I, see where I'm going with this? We, we, our minds are always thinking. You know, we need to be thinking in the things of God. We need to be thinking in moving forward for the kingdom and doing things for him. But he will always have the final say. We don't know everything that God is up to. Or, well, first off, he wouldn't be a God worth worshiping. It is his secret will for our lives that he pans out over time. And I don't know it at the time. Faith. I trust him. He's going to work it out, not me. So I'm not running around telling people something that I think God told me. But really, you know what it was? <laughs> that Mexican food I had earlier. And I got this heartburn, right? And it's burning up within me, you know? Yeah, yeah God told me. No. And dare I say, to borrow the words of Paul, may it never be. May it never be. The Holy Spirit testifies with clear proofs by the fruit that he produces in my life and in your life. These things will take time. You look back, praise God, that was the Lord. You look back and you think of things, it's always good. I encourage you, look back sometimes over what God has done. You know, I would almost like to start a prayer journal here for us, a, a, a folder, a binder of just things, prayer requests, praise reports, that we could look back sometimes, you know, spend an hour just going through together as a group and looking at all the things. Hey, remember this prayer? Hey, there it is, answered praise, you know. Hey, remember this we were looking at? There it is. Wow, God, you know, you've done so much and you're worthy, God, that we would take the time to spend in, in looking back at all the things. Does you see what I mean? All the meanwhile, the Holy Spirit is working these things in your life. I mean, I don't know, man. I, I, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I mean, you guys probably already know this. Pretty much everything I'm preaching and teaching as we go is pretty much the first time I've really preached and taught these things because this is kind of my first pastoral ministry. Do you see what I mean? So what we're learning together, and I have to say, this last week has been crazy spiritually warfare-wise. Anybody else? Man, I hate my sin. Yes. We hate what God hates. Yes. And we should know that. Absolutely. And the more I grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ by his word, the more it's not the big things, it's all the things that I hate now. <laughs> the more aware I am of those things, and I hate them that much more. And, and that's... We're growing, we're maturing, we're growing together, right? The Holy Spirit testifies with clear proofs by the fruit that he produces in my life and in yours. Let me ask you something. Before you got saved, did you bear any fruit at all for the kingdom of God? Kingdom who? For the kingdom of God. <laughs> right, exactly, Bob. Kingdom who? I mean, before you got saved, did you bear any fruit at all for the kingdom of God? You were cut off. I was cut off. I wasn't part of the family of God. I was nothing. Not only did I not, but I wasn't even able to do so. Even if somewhere in my pea little brain somewhere, let's say I had a thought that I actually like wanted to, you know what I mean? Couldn't even do it if I wanted to. Why? Because to this day, it's still not me that bears the fruit. It's the Holy Spirit that lives within me, that dwells within me, that guides me, that leads me, that illuminates the word for me as I read, as I study, as we come together. He's the one that is working in your life and producing the fruit in your life. The Holy Spirit is the one who testifies with our spirit. He does so by the fruit that he produces and bears in our lives. Now, of course, without further ado, can anybody guess where we're going now? Galatians 5, 22 through 23. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians. Galatians chapter 
five. <clears throat> you know, and there's, there's, I mean, like I, like I said, uh, one of these days we're going to do an exhaustive study on this. I mean, I'm looking at verse 16, but I say, walk by the Spirit. You will not carry out the desires. Of the th this is really what's going on, and we've been dealing with this on Sunday in our spiritual warfare study. Putting off the old self, putting on the new self, putting off the deeds of darkness, putting on the armor of light, putting off things, putting on things. You're putting off things because these are things that are no longer acceptable uh, as Christians. These are no longer things that the Holy Spirit allows, right? And again, we all sin. We all fall short of God's glory. The weights that drag you. They are the weights that drag you through the mud at high speed. Bam, 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 bam. You know what I mean? That's a rock. Ouch. <laughs> they are the things that drag you down. You want to walk by the Spirit. There are things we must be putting off, and there are things we must be putting on so that we can go on to maturity. And this takes time. This takes knowing the Word of God. So Galatians 5, 22 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing there is no law. So the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the source of these character qualities which he brings about in the life of a born-again believer. The Holy Spirit is the source of these character qualities which he brings about in the life of a born-again believer. Again, before I was saved, I was verses 17, right? For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things you please. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, this was me, the deeds of the flesh are evident. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This was my old self. Anybody else? This was my old manner of life. But the fruit of the Spirit are these character qualities, these works, deeds, actions, characteristics, which are in exact opposition to the other things. The Holy Spirit is the source of these character qualities he brings about in the life of the born-again believer. So fruit is used here metaphorically, obviously, right? We're not talking about apples and stuff, right? It's a metaphor. It is used metaphorically to mean a few things. So there's a few ways that it's used, right? The first way it is used is that of works or deeds. And we see this in the words of Jesus in Matthew 7, 16, where he says, you will know them by their fruits, right? Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles, right? So he's using this as you will know them by their fruits, right? He's dealing with false teachers and you will know them by their fruits. You will know them by these ways uh, that, are ex that are manifested, okay, in their lives. You will know them by their fruits. And then Jesus uses another illustration about the grapes being gathered from thorn bushes and figs from thistles. But then another way it is used is that of characteristics or character qualities. And in this context, of course, Jesus speaking of the false prophets who will come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And he gives us a clear, if you will, way that we can, if you will, spot these phonies. Oh, and there's a source that drives them, a power, if you will, and it's inwardly, these are ravenous wolves, but you'll know them. You'll be able to spot them. You'll be able to spot them because of the fruit, right? Here, fruit is the visible expression of power working inwardly and invisibly. Again, the Holy Spirit's invisible. He's working in us. He dwells within us. He's working okay, inwardly and he's working invisibly in our lives. 
also with these characters as well. The character of the fruit being evidence of the character of the power producing it. You guys with me? And I read that again. Here, fruit is the visible expression, okay, something I can, can see, of power working inwardly and invisibly. Something going on inside, there's a vi- invisibly, and there's a visible expression, okay? The character of the fruit being evidence of the character of the power producing it. As the visible expressions of hidden lusts are the works of the flesh, so the invisible power of the Holy Spirit in those who are brought into living union with Christ produces the fruit of the Spirit. I want to make it clear that that, that scripture is not only just for false prophets, but it's for believers who claim that they are Christians. Yeah. And Jesus went on to teach the same fruit by telling believers, those who should believe, how they could tell the difference. And that was, he explained by, apple tree can only put out an apple. Mm -hmm. It cannot put out an orange. So when you see someone that's putting out good fruit, and it's always, it should always be that good fruit. Yeah. And then the other is easy to identify because his fruit is dead. Yeah. And all he's producing is limbs that are cut down and thrown into the fire, Jesus said. Yeah. So there, there's a, a, I just wanted to make it clear that because it's not just false prophets. Right. There is people. False ravenous wolves. Inwardly, these people. So inwardly, these people are driven by something externally something is going to be produced inwardly we're being driven by the holy spirit and the word of god externally love joy peace patience these things are being produced again here fruit is the visible expression of power working inwardly and invisibly the character of the fruit being evidence of the character of the power Producing it, again, is the visible expressions of hidden lusts or the works of the flesh. So the invisible power of the Holy Spirit in those who are brought into living union with Christ produces the fruit of the Spirit. And again, let me see if I can demonstrate that with Scripture. So without further ado, turn over to John chapter 8. I want to demonstrate this. I want to demonstrate this with Scripture. And uh, I I put some thought into this, and I hope this really does um, drive home this point uh, that, that I'm trying to make here about, you know, the, the, the work of the Spirit will be evidenced by certain things. As Bob was saying, though, too, the other side, the false prophets, the fake, phony, pseudo-Christians, the work of what is driving them invisibly, internally, will be expressed outwardly. You will know them by their fruit as well. So John chapter 8, verse 44 and 45 Jesus speaking, and he says this, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, his own being internally, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And then Jesus says, but because I speak the truth, you do not believe me, right? <laughs> do, do you see what I mean? There's, so th- there's an example. So here Jesus rebukes the Pharisees, the religious leaders of that day, because of their conduct. What did they want to do? They wanted to kill Jesus. I speak the truth, but because I do, you don't believe me. Wait, 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 verse 46, but which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? Hmm. 47, he who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear them because you are not of God. So there's kind of an example, all right? What is the source driving them? What is... Sonship is predicated on conduct and their works were of the devil. Okay? Whenever Satan speaks, he speaks from his own nature, that is, 
Ready for this? The inward, invisible power that is working in Satan. Also, the inward, invisible power that is working in these religious leaders because of their conduct, their works and deeds, because of who they were, Jesus called them out by their fruit. You want to kill me? You want this and that? Let me ask you, which one of you convicts me of sin? <laughs> You're liars. You're of your father, the devil. Mm, interesting. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. Pat's favorite uh, book there. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. So we saw, we saw, okay, it's an external, if you will, uh, thing with these religious leaders, okay? Again, the, their fruit was the visible expression, okay, of the power working inwardly and invisibly in them, all right? That, that, was, their, that was the expression. Now, as Christians... Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. What does it say? Therefore, be what? Imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Here we are told to imitate God. As, as children of God, we are called to emulate our Father. Okay? who is in heaven. Man. Mission impossible. Dun, 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 dun. Good luck. Well, praise God, we don't believe in luck. This is done by the inward, invisible power of the Holy Spirit and is manifested by our conduct and our character qualities. Does that make sense? That biblical example kind of... A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. A Christian, that is, a true born-again believer, can surely sin and does. But regardless, you will bear good fruit. It is inevitable. Why? Because you're not the one bearing it. He is. He's the one who bears fruit in your life. Yes, there are things we need to put off, put on, so that we can go on to maturity. That's why we're here tonight. That's what we're doing. We're, we're putting off things. We're putting on things. We're, we're learning. We're growing together. We're fighting together. We're co-soldiers for Jesus Christ. And every time we come together, I don't know, if we could get a glimpse into the spirit world at this point in time, You'd see some pretty pissed off demons, I think. And I'm just saying, it's, it's, it's because of this right here. Because of the Holy Spirit who's bearing witness with us. Because of God. Because of the works that He is doing here through us. Yeah. Yes, Pat? But every once in a while, that old man, even though we're spirit-filled, yep. that old man will lift up his yes. face and his head and do something that you just don't believe that you just did. Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. By uh, actually Romans 12, uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I mean, really, th this is our marching orders. This is our instructions as Christians. After all chapters 1 through 11, Paul goes with this. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, literally, strong exhortation. Not only that, I come alongside of you. Please, he says, understand you are who you are by the mercies of God. And by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. This is your spirit spiritual service of worship and do not be squeezed into the mold of this world no uh -uh. not you Christian this isn't for you you be transformed by the renewing of your mind 
so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Are you going to fall? <laughs> you get up. You get up and you fight. Simply put, as the visible expressions of hidden lusts are the work of the flesh, so the invisible power of the Holy Spirit in those who are brought into a living union with Christ produces the fruit of the Spirit. Turn over to John 15. Yes, sir. John chapter 15. Like I said, I don't know how far we're going to get. We're going to have part three. I know that. I wanted to get through the workbook on this. But I did my very best by the power of the Holy Spirit and by God's grace and mercy to make this as clear biblically as I could. Look, I know if I can understand it, then anybody can because I'm not that smart. You know what I mean? So I try to make it to where it's totally understood. I actually bounced it off of Deb. She's, she's feeling better now. And, and I was like, I need, listen to this. Does this make sense to you? You know, I want it to be clear. Because again, the church is so powerless, first off, because they don't pray and, and because they don't understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You got two extremes with this, okay? You got the one over here that is just, uh, I heard the greatest term I ever heard today, charismania. <laughs> John MacArthur, care, you've got this that, that it definitely has nothing to do. This is not what the Holy Spirit does. Then you've got the side over here, if you will, the more fundamental Baptist that won't touch anything that has anything to do with the Holy Spirit out of fear that that is what they'll get attributed to them. Whereas, this is the day we live in. Nope. I'm not going to touch it at all. Over here, whoa, jumping around, flopping fish type of, you know what I mean, on the floor. And you can't, you, you can't push because of others. We always need to come back to what does the Bible say? Because you know what? We're robbing ourselves personally, if you will, of a just wonderfully, delightfully fruitful life in Jesus Christ by, because other people are, what, making things look bad? We're not them. We're here. And we're definitely not these over here going, well, because of that. No, no. What happened to this? <laughs> That's what I want. That's what I need in my life. John 15. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Who's doing this in our lives? Thank you, Jesus. Wow. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Verse 5, he who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Say that again. The whole thing? No. Apart from me, you can do nothing. No, more apart from me, you can do nothing. If we could get that in our heads and rely on having more of a relationship yep. with the Holy Spirit, of being able to discern and hear and see the difference between... The dog jumping up and down. <laughs> and, and the, the person over here who's yeah. quiet and meek and... and Fundamental. You know, Funny mental. They're not really going anywhere, but they they got plenty of love. Yeah. But they're not growing either. And, and again, the sad part is, is there are true born-again believers on both sides. Yes. But again, do you see what we've done tonight? you know how many verses we've gone through? you know how much work that is, putting that together? I don't want to do that much work. That's too much work. You know what? This looks good to me. I'll take it. This looks safe to me. I'm okay over here. Do you see what I mean? Man, we are called to, to know this word. This is everything. Is it work? Yeah. Are you going to hell? Nah. What are you going to do with your time? Man, there's only one life, it will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ shall last. 
Uh, back to First John, or I mean not First John, John 15. Thank you, Bob, for that. You're absolutely right. Verse 6, we'll read that again. Or verse uh, verse uh, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Oh, and by the way, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, guess what? And my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Again, that mean a car, house. No, according to the Father's will. Verse 8, my Father's glorified by this that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. God, I'm asking, please use this pitiful, miserable, wretched little life here to bear fruit for you, that by this you be glorified, God, and that, Lord, by my life, I prove to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. There's my prayer. New car, new house. We don't want none of that. I want to glorify God by bearing fruit. Which means there's a lot of me that's got to go. Lord, teach me. I want to be more like Jesus in everything. Now go over to verse 16. Still in chapter 5, verse 16 says this. <clears throat> Uh-oh. What do you do with this verse? Oh, no. We're in trouble. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. As we have been brought into union with Christ, so we also abide in him and the Holy Spirit bears fruit. Apart from him, we bear no fruit. In fact, apart from Jesus, we would just be thrown away cast into the fire for all eternity. So the witness of the Holy Spirit is this, union with Christ and the bearing of fruit. Sorry to burst your bubble. No, I'm not. That's biblical. Again, Galatians 5, and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are all good things. Oh, and guess what? Last time I checked, they work well in the body of Christ. <laughs> Self-control. Notice it is the fruit of the Spirit, not plural fruits. The singular fruit here is important and is suggesting the unity of the character of the Lord as the Holy Spirit reproduces these characteristics in us. It's all one thing. This is the Lord. We put on the Lord. We put on Jesus Christ. We put on his character qualities, and guess what? Hey, Christian, our behavior starts to become pretty decent, man. You know what? <laughs> hey, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. The Holy Spirit reproduces these in us. These are character qualities that are who Jesus Christ is. And now, as those who belong to Jesus Christ, we too, by the power of the Holy Spirit, also share in these character qualities. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These I want in my life. Lord, produce these things in our lives by your Spirit. The witness of the Holy Spirit. You're not who you once were. You don't do the things you once did. Yeah, the old man is still clinging on literally as a dead body tied to you. What do we do about that? We know what the Scripture says. We seek the Lord in everything. We put off. We put on. By God's grace, we go on to maturity. What are you going to do tomorrow? I'm going to put off. I'm going to put on. And by God's grace, I'm going to go on to maturity. What am I going to do the next day? <laughs> I'm going to put off. I'm going to put on. I'm going to go on. It keeps growing, and the Holy Spirit continues to bear fruit. And no matter what, through our sins, through our trials, through our tribulations, through 
Everything we go through, through the stupid things we do as people at times, He is still bearing fruit in your life. Because if you belong to Him, He can only bear fruit through Himself in your life. He does this. No, but you better be careful. You'll lose your salvation. Then you got to get it back. Then you're going to lose it again. You got to get it back. How amazing is this? Wow. And next week, we're going to be in the Witness of the Holy Spirit, part three. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> uh, Father, we just we thank you so much, God. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that we get to come together as your people and we get to study together, Lord, and we get to learn. We get to see your word come to life in our lives. We get to look back and we get to see just how you have worked things out, God. And here we are in the middle of it. We thank you that your, your, your promises are true. We thank you, Jesus, that, that you're holding on to us and, and you're holding tight to us, Lord. Uh, we thank you that we can never fall that we will never eternally be separated from you, that we have the promise of eternal life because the source of our eternal life. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, God, that dwells within us, that guides us, teaches us, that, that leads us on. We thank you that you are present with us always. Thank you so much, God, for this study. Just pray, God, you'd please help us to continue to grow, to continue to put off and put on and go on each and every day as we battle. We thank you that it is your strength that keeps us. It is your armor that keeps us. It is your spirit that guides us. And Father, we love you. Help us to learn more and to submit more to the leading of the spirit. God, help us, God, please. Just move us out of the way and make us more like Jesus Christ in everything. Father, please bear much fruit with this study to these lives that belong to you. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name, and all God's people said, amen. amen.